as Pitt mentioned, my name is Josh. So if you, uh, if you take issue with anything that I say, if your blood pressure gets up and you want to have a polite discussion or an angry one, don't email josh at dwarfhopepdx.org. That'll go to the other Josh. I want to spare him of that. Email Josh Wilder at dwarfhopepdx.org. So I just want to get that cleared up first off. Um, the other thing is, the last time I was here <clears throat> speaking at a Sunday or main event Door of Hope thing at the OG Door of Hope was, well, it was at 9 o'clock. But, <laughs> but other than that, it was 10 years ago. And as I look around, I don't see many faces that I know from back then. Perhaps I scared them away. I don't know. So Josh hasn't asked me to, to speak at one of these for 10 years, and maybe you're going to find out <laughs> why here pretty soon. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't that he said, hey, 10 years from now, I want you to have a sermon ready or something like that. I'm actually uh, not only an elder, but I'm, uh, I'm on staff at Door of Hope Northeast part-time. So I spend 25 hours a week working somewhere else. And this is my first time doing a sermon two weeks in a row. So please be gracious to me. And please be gracious to Josh or if somebody's listening to this online or wherever and you go to a different church, be gracious to your pastors. This is probably a little bit more difficult than it looks. I feel like this, is this thing banging into things? Okay, we're okay. So go, go easy on your, on your pastor. But please email me if you take issue with anything. I need to be straightened out by other people. And my wife does a good job, but, you know, she needs help. <clears throat> okay, enough with the uh, sort of awkward intro introductory things. I want to talk about me. I want to talk about COVID. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I do want to talk about who is here, who here is kind of done over, I'm over 2021. Right? It's, we, we thought 2020 was bad. And since I'm sure y'all have forgotten, I'll just run through a few, a few of the things that we went through. There's the pandemic, of course. Um, then there was a whole lot of race rioting that went on for a long time. Then we had fires that kept us all indoors and made our air quite toxic for several weeks. And then, of course, an election of elections. And then 2021 hits, and we have a storming of the Capitol. We even have a storming of the continent by the weather, winter storming, uh, that left probably many of you out of power and has left millions of others out of power. Uh, and by power, I mean electricity, by the way. And then if you, if you paid attention, uh, just the last week, uh, a very beloved um, Christian apologist, Ravi Zacharias, it came out that he was actually living a double life and was kind of a pervert and a um, sexual predator. And that was, that was a real punch in the gut for me. Too. So uh, <clears throat> I, say, I bring all this up to say, well, okay, life is going insane. Maybe, maybe we're going insane along with it. I know there are a lot of people who are like, bye-bye, 2020, can't wait for you to go away, bring on 2021, you know, as though at a, something magical is going to happen between 11.59 on December 31st and in 12 on January 1st. No, life is just life. Time just goes on. So we may be getting going insane along with it, but really the question the question that sort of enters our, our mind, maybe not you guys' mind, but some, some people's mind, when life appears to be going insane and falling apart is, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all this? Where is he indeed? And now um, I will just briefly, this is an aside, say to you, if you're wondering that here or online 10 years from now, if you're wondering where God is, He's right here with us. He always has been. So if you're hurting, if you're particularly hurting, God is with you. See, we use this word unprecedented, an unprecedented amount in the last year or so. We've used it quite a bit. But nothing is unprecedented for God, I'll have you know. Nothing is unprecedented for him. He's not reacting to our world. We are reacting to our world. God has been working since the beginning of time, and actually time itself is catching up to what God is doing. 
Time itself, and we along with time, we're catching up to what God is already doing. And this should, this should encourage us, right? If you look in Scripture and you look at the ways that God has shown up in a really big way, it hasn't been when things are all great. When God rescued his people in the Exodus, they were enslaved. It's pretty, pretty low. When Jesus comes along, <clears throat> it wasn't at the height of Israel's rule with Solomon. It's, it's not even when they, were, um, when they gained their independence from Greece by the Maccabees and the Hasmonean dynasty. No, Israel had been run over by Assyria, by Babylon, by Persia, then by Greece, and then by Rome before Jesus came. So it's in those dark and low moments where God appears to really show up in a big way. So I'm looking for that. I'm actually looking for God to show up. We may see something big happen. But even if we don't, and it may be that we don't, even if we don't, God is still working. He seems to prefer, for the most part, to work in these subtle small ways. He seems to slowly chip away at his work, kind of like the sun. You know, the sun, how does a, how does a, a plant grow? Well, you, it's not like you plant the seed and the next day you have a big tree. It's very, very subtle. It works very, very slowly. That's how God does his work a lot of the time. And uh, it's slow. It's not impressive, but it is work nonetheless. So if you have a Bible, now we're going to actually get into the text. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4. It's also encouraging to know that not only does God show up in big ways when things get really rough, but that Paul's world, Jesus' world, was actually no better than ours. The world was far darker and far more, uh, filled with far more suffering back then than it is now, even with all that we have faced. So, you know, a few examples of this would be, you know, it's, it's hard for us to not have electricity for a few weeks. That really sucks. Or maybe a few months. Some people still don't have electricity. But in their world, there was no electricity. They never had it. They didn't miss it. But not only that, but, the, you know, when the economy goes down, there's no gov- government stimulus to, to bail you out. There's no however many trillions of dollars of debt they can add to to keep things going. You don't have any social security when you're too old to work, or 401ks or anything like that for that matter. You don't have disability. And not only that, but they had the divisions that we have even within the church. They had the, the Sadducees were, were essentially the, the theological left of that world. They'd sort of compromised theologically and, and really adopted the ways of thinking that, that their culture provided, and they were in bed with power. And then you had the Pharisees who were kind of like the moderate conservatives trying to hang on to their trying to hang on to their history. And then you had the people on the far right who were called the zealots, and these were people who were willing to actually commit murder and start insurrections in order to overthrow the government. So uh, you know, well, all I'm trying to say in all this is not I, I'm not trying to belittle anyone's pain or trauma right now. What I'm trying to say is that God is not is no stranger to the world being in chaos. Okay, he's he's been he's been used to it and been working for a long time. Okay, so so up here to to Paul, the pot and the treasure. I I mentioned this in first service. I didn't think about this title before I sent out the PowerPoint. And it is, this could very easily be misconstrued in our culture, but I think I'm going to say we're trying to reach out to the cannabis-consuming community. Maybe it'll get their attention and they'll listen in here. That was a joke, by the way, so feel free to laugh if you, when you get it. <clears throat> so, okay, 2 Corinthians 4. Paul writes this letter, 2 Corinthians. And who is Paul? Just by way of reminder, okay, Paul's more zealous than any of us will ever be. He is, he is just on fire for God. He's going to do God's work. He's going to be, I'm your man, God. He's going to do it. And so how does he do it? He sees this inordinate sect that's worshiping a man as God, and he's going to stomp it out. And so he's, he murders and ruins the lives of a lot of Christians. And then when Jesus gets a hold of him and says, you're working for the wrong team, Jesus doesn't slay him, 
kill his life, repay him for all, that, for all that Paul has done to his people. No, Jesus forgives him and says, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to be on my team and I'm gonna forgive you all your wrongs. And that message for Paul, ooh, that took hold of him. That took hold of him and he wanted to tell everybody about this Jesus, this God who takes his enemies who are fighting against him and he forgives them and he transforms them and he gives them a new life. So that's Paul. He goes around and he's telling everyone this and what that usually gets him is beat up pretty much everywhere he goes. It was rare, rare for Paul to leave a town without a scratch and without incident. You know, we, we coast right on out of a town, but usually Paul was kicked out by a riot or he got beaten and got dragged out on some occasions. People didn't like Paul's message. And people didn't like Paul. You can imagine introducing Paul. Hey, this is my friend, Paul. He says a lot of things that tick people off and he gets beat up all the time. I'm sure people wouldn't say like, well, I want to hear what this guy has to say. You know, my blood pressure's low. I, I need a punching bag. Probably not going to happen. So that's Paul. He's, he's not impressive to look at. He doesn't have an impressive resume. But he shows up and he's enthusiastic about Jesus. Now, let's talk up for a minute about Corinth. Now, Corinth was a very affluent culture. It drew in a lot of the, sort of the cream of the crop. And one of the... Uh, what would you call it? One of the forms of entertainment, you might say, was rhetoric, which is very, very good public speaking. And um, maybe you're saying I should take some classes on that. I don't know. But uh, that, was, that was sort of like a, a, I don't know if you call it high art, but it was like high entertainment, let's call it that. Paul wasn't very good at that. <clears throat> but the Corinthians were looking for that. Corinth was affluent kind of in the way that Portland is sort of affluent in food. People move to Portland because they say, oh, there's such great food here. There's such great food. And so for a Corinthian, going and hearing Paul is kind of like going to Applebee's for a Portlander, right? And I know, that, I know that we all love kitsch art and we all love freezer food that's really expensive. That was another joke, by the way. Man, I'm striking out here. Uh, sorry if you really, really like Applebee's. Um, yeah, so not impressive, not something to write home about. And that's what the Corinthians were thinking about Paul. He got word of this. And so he's writing about it in this, in this letter. He's responding to this accusation. Hey, you know, I heard that guy, Paul, and he was not, he was not that impressive. He was not, he kind of wasn't worth listening to. So in chapter three is one of the places where Paul brings this up. And Paul essentially says, you're, you're looking for my CV. You're looking for my resume to be really impressive. Well, I don't have it. I don't have a resume that's, you know, signed on the dotted line from, you know, the professors at Harvard or Yale or Princeton or whatever. Um, no, I, I have a, actually a different kind of resume. You know what my resume is? <clears throat> it's actually written by God's Spirit on your hearts. The fact that you listen to me, the fact that anyone listened to me is, is because... God has written my resume. So don't be fooled. He says, God was working through this thing called the old co an old covenant ministry with Moses. And what happened in that old covenant, the reason why it's an old covenant, by the way, is that God was doing away with it and made a way for the new covenant. But if the old one was full of so much glory that Moses' face glowed when he talked to God, Moses' face glowed. That's crazy. If you ever see somebody's face glow, it'll probably freak you out. I know it would freak me out. So call, let me know if you ever see this. I want to see it. Um, but, but Moses' face glowed and it freaked people out. So they said, Moses, I'm sorry. We need to put a bag over your head, basically. I don't know if they cut eye holes in there or what. But, <clears throat> but there was a veil that was required to cover the glory of God that was in the face of Moses. And now we get into chapter four, where Paul has said, this new covenant ministry has even more glory than that. But he says, the reason why I don't dress up the gospel, the reason why I don't trumpet up and make myself and make the gospel look really impressive is because there's a veil that hides 
the glory of God from people. And that veil is put before people's eyes by the devil. So if I make it look super impressive, you're still not going to believe it. You need that veil to be removed. And he says it's removed by the God who shines in our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So there's up to chapter 4, verse 6. Now we're going to get to verse 7 here. I'll read it. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Okay, so he's talking about a treasure and a clay jar. Okay, what is the treasure? The treasure is this this glory of this new covenant ministry, the, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That's the treasure. And he says we have it in, in these clay jars, <clears throat> and, and the, the clay jar really is our life, our bodies, what we have around us. And it's interesting, what, um, a clay jar is an adequate vessel in Paul's time, It's an adequate vessel to hold things, but the thing with clay is that it's really fragile. You know, if you knock it off a table, it's gonna shatter, it's gonna break, it's gonna crack. If you really have a treasure, something you really treasure, you wouldn't use a clay clay jar. You would use some kind of stone. You'd use a stone vessel. And these these were not uncommon. If you remember in the Gospels, there's a woman who comes to Jesus with an alabaster flask of perfume. And she has to break it open. Probably took a little bit of work to get in there. So this is a treasured, a treasured um, item here. It would cost probably about $35,000 or so nowadays. So that's, that's a treasured possession. And these alabaster um, vessels were used to hold some kind of treasure. Interestingly enough, when I was looking, I, I was kind of looking this up, I found out that in Egypt they used alabaster um, vessels to hold the entrails of people that they uh, they embalmed or whatever. So, you know, make sure something precious gets, gets in there. I'm not going to use a clay jar. might get broken. So, the reason why Paul uses this, I'm bringing all this up. <clears throat> Paul could have said, oh yeah, we have it in a stone vessel, but he doesn't. He says we have it in a clay vessel. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have it in a clay vessel. Why? Why is it in a clay vessel? Well, let's keep going. Verse um, 8, I think it is. So we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Okay, so he says we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the power of, belongs to God and not to us. Okay, fine. So now we're, he talks about being persecuted, struck down, afflicted. So these are all kind of like pressures. Paul's no stranger to the pressures of life. You know, we have the, we have the pressures of just daily, the daily grind, but he has the actual malevolence of other people hitting him. So he knows what it's like to be afflicted. And those, he's saying, these, these pressures, um, they produce cracks in the pot. What Paul actually calls them, he calls them the death of Jesus. We carry around the death of Jesus in this broken and frail pot Those cracks are the death. And why do we have those? Well, it's so that the light can shine through the cracks. See, this is is a different kind of treasure. This is a treasure that you don't need to contain it. You don't need to protect it. This treasure is designed to actually be shown through the vessel. That's why it's clay and not stone. So when the pressure of life squeezes us, the cracks show, then the light of God's glory is supposed to shine through. That's what Paul is saying. Now, I'm going to go ahead and hit pause right here because some of you may be asking, well, let me rephrase that. Probably not any of you because you're all very pious here. But maybe somebody theoretically 
somebody might be asking, well, this, is, this seems like a convenient arrangement for God, right? So I get to be crushed and suffer and he gets to get the glory. Isn't that a convenient arrangement for him? Now this question goes all the way back to the garden. This is the question of, well, is God really for us? Is he really for himself? Is God just using me for his own ends? Or is God really, really for me? And I think that's a legitimate question to ask every once in a while. If you haven't asked it, probably your life hasn't got bad enough, so just wait. <laughs> It'll come. It'll come. If 2021 hasn't, hasn't got you there, well, something will. Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't answer that question directly, actually. But we can see sort of indirectly by examining his assumptions how, how maybe he would respond to that. So we'll move, move on to verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Okay, we'll stop there. So, faith. He says, we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. And then he quotes Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Psalm 116 is is a psalm of praise to God for his deliverance. He delivered the author out of some kind of trouble. He says, I believed, I trust, I believed in God and so I spoke. So what what he's talking, what Paul's talking about here is faith. And faith grows most significantly when life is at its hardest, when you've had enough. Until then, you were just kind of going along. Okay, you're God and I'm not, and okay, fine, I'll go along. My daughter had, uh, uh, my daughter provides a good example for this, by the way. She's, uh, I have a 10-month-old daughter, Trinity, and before, before I became a father, I remember friends who had kids would say they could distinguish between the different cries of their children. And I thought, that's crazy. A baby's crying, a baby's crying. I hear the same thing. Now I know what they're talking about. This thing is real. It's real, I tell you. So she has this one that's kind of like, meh, meh. You know, it's kind of like the, hey, I'm kind of not okay with what's going on here, but take your time. And then, then she has the, I'm done. I'm done. It's over cry. Ah, You know, the one that gets you really in the room quickly. Until you have that second kind of cry, you've really just kind of gone along with God. It's not until you're saying, that's it, enough. God, I want answers right now. Come on, you and me, you and me right here. When you get there, when you get to that point, you're kind of at this, this hinge point where you could really, you could put your trust in God still when you're sure he's too late. You could still put your trust in him or you could walk away. When you actually follow through and put your trust in him, your faith is gonna grow like crazy and you know what's gonna happen. Someone else is gonna see it. The jar is cracking and the light's gonna shine through and other people are gonna see it. They're gonna look at you and they're gonna say, how are you doing that? How are you able to cope. My sister just wrote me the other day, we do this old thing called letter writing with actual stamps, you know, and, and handwriting, it's hard to, hard to see. And she told me about two of her friends, one who uh, had a miscarriage after 12 weeks, which is really sad because the first trimester is painful and they're now childless with that one, and another friend whose child has, I think it's called anencephaly or something like that, which means that this baby is either gonna die in the womb or shortly after it's born. There's no way around it. That's hard. That's really, really hard. When that sort of crushing happens and you still have faith in God, when other people see that, their faith jumps through the roof too. They want to believe what you believe. They want to have what you have. You see, God's glory is shown through our faith. 
It's through our faith that his glory is shown. It goes out and reaches more and more people. His grace reaches more and more people. When he is glorified, his glory is not about his self, um, selfish attention seeking or something like that. God's glory isn't what he gets. It's, it goes out. It's like light. It spread abroad. It's spread abroad. That's what God's glory is about. That's what he says here in verse 15. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. God's glory goes out. It doesn't suck in. Okay, verse 16. So, we do not lose heart. By the way, he said this in... in, um, Chapter four, verse one, this is the second time he said this. So, in light of all of this, we do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Hmm. So we're wasting away. We are all wasting away, by the way, even when life is going well. I have less hair than I did 10 years ago. If we had video of that sermon that I did, whenever that was, I would look a lot younger and a lot more ridiculous, too. I think I was a redneck trying to be a hipster, actually, at that point. Man, you guys are a rough crowd. That was supposed to be funny. <laughs> well, I, I know not to give up my job and start doing comedy at least, right? Okay, so we're wasting away. Paul doesn't deny that. This isn't blissful ignorance. This isn't denying the obvious. We're wasting away. In musical terms, the notes we're hearing are in a minor key. This is a dirge. This is a sad song. But what Paul's saying is that there's another song being composed. Jesus is actually taking all the notes of this dirge, all those notes in a minor key, and he's using them, adding his own notes, wrapping them together in this symphony that's going to be so glorious that what we're experiencing right now will just be entirely obliterated. We won't even really remember it. But you have to have your ear tuned to hear the music. Now, I just... I just took Paul's metaphor of sight and turned it into our ears, but it's the same idea. It's something you can't see that is happening. Once again, my daughter, when you have an infant, there's so much change going on that you can't see. You can't see that she's changing. You can't see what she's learning every single day, but she's learning a ton every day. It's not what you see, it's it's what you don't see. That's what you look for. When, when you have your eyes on what's seen, then it's weighty. But when you have your eyes on what is not seen, well, then it becomes light and momentary. Okay. <clears throat> that's, the, uh, that's the end of the exposition, I guess you could say, of this text. And, uh, well, I just want to say this before I move on. Before I move on. So, if, if you're really hurting, if, if you're really experiencing trauma and you're at the bottom, I fear that what I have just said will sound all cold and logical and it doesn't really, doesn't really hit you where you're at. So I just want to say, to maybe help with that, I'm not saying this as somebody who's just, you know, being a biblical exegete. I'm saying what I'm saying out of my own experience because 10 years ago when I did the sermon, a few weeks before that, Josh, Josh White, the other Josh, the real Josh, <laughs> he asked me to come on staff and I really wanted to. I wanted it really badly. I had been waiting a long time for that. But I didn't. And the reason why I didn't was because at that time I was married to somebody who did not want to be in ministry. She would not have been supportive in that, and I didn't want to drag this church through what that would have been. So I said no. 
And eventually she left, and I lost her, and I lost a lot of friends, and I lost my home, and I lost my hopes, and I lost my dreams. And it was very hard. I cried buckets for a very long time. So when I say these questions that you all look piously like you don't ask, you probably do. We all, you don't know what people are carrying with them. We all walk around with a brave face. But I'm telling you, if you're hurting, I know what that's like. I don't necessarily know your experience, but I know what it's like to really hurt and to feel sort of the cold logic not really be compelling. I just want you to see beyond that. Okay, enough of that side note. I want to move to something. (coughs) Actually, I'm going to take some water. I'm not used to speaking for so long. Usually I just preach once a month, and now I've done it twice in one day, and then I did it last week too. Oh, that's bad. I had tea, and then I just added cold water to it. That's horrible. Uh, Okay, try to keep going. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, application. That's what I'm going to try and do. I know last time I was at Door of Hope, Josh is not big in an application, so I put a question mark on there. So, application. Okay, one, first one. And we can learn from this text. Examine your expectations and assumptions. Oh, this is good. This is real good. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about my daughter because I'm a crazy dad. You know, I don't have Facebook probably at this point, but it, it, like if I did, I would have like a million pictures of my daughter on there. I'm, I'm like that crazy dad. So another illustration from her, hopefully this is the last one. I probably owe her something when she's 10 years old because of this. So when she eats... She has, she, so she's, she is so adorable, and I know every parent says they have the cutest kid in the world, but I'm the only one who's right. <laughs> she is so adorable until it's time to eat, and then something happens. She transforms into a monster. She, like, she, like, devolves into this animal-like state where she she has this expectation that she should be able to keep eating without swallowing, right? So she'll she'll sit there and she'll go, "Mm, mm, 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 mm." and if you don't give her another bite, she'll go, "Mm, mm, 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 mm." you know, she just gets worse and worse and worse. We all have expectations like this, right? We're all all just a bunch of grown-up kids. You know, God never says, oh, um, uh, we're, we're adults of God. No, that, ne- that never happens. We're all children of God. We're all really children like him. We have these expectations, right? You go, you go to the grocery store and you expect that the parking lot will only be so full and the lines will only be so long and if that doesn't happen, then we're irritated. Or you go to work and you expect them to hire competent people to work alongside Or on the national level, we expect that the most competent leaders would be rising to the top, so you'd have somebody to vote for that you're actually excited about. And then when that doesn't happen, we're angry, right? We have these expectations, you know. We we expect the power to always be on. We expect for political discourse to always be civil. We expect for the revolutionaries to not even make it into the news because they're so far out on the fringes, you know. We expect disease, pandemics, weather to always be at bay and not affect us, right? We, we actually have these expect, expectations. We don't realize that we have them, but we have them, all right? We all do. So my question is, are these, are these realistic for a fallen world? These really realistic expectations? You know, if, if you're even a, the most cursory student of history, one of the things you'll know is that civilizations die, Peace among peoples, differing peoples, that's an achievement. That takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of thinking, the right people in place. The disintegration of society is the norm. The pulling together is the exception. Yet we tend to think that our experience of life should be the norm. It isn't. We are the exception. If we're going to think <clears throat> that God is only present, that God is only present when pain is absent, 
and God, therefore God is absent when pain is present. What we're doing is we're saying God can only be at work in the lives of almost nobody <laughs> who's ever existed. You know, God is, God is hanging out with the point zero 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 one percent because the life we live today, even kings a thousand years ago couldn't imagine the life that we live today. So we know that that's not how it is. God is with the brokenhearted. God is with those who are crushed. We need to examine our expectations and say, what do we expect? Do we expect that God's gonna insulate us from the, the pain of ordinary human existence? I mean, the pain that billions and billions of people before us and around us have experienced. God should, God should spare us from that, right? Never, never have, have, has there been a people who have been so insulated from the, the regular trauma of life and yet been so traumatized when it actually happens. This is a novelty. This is not, um, this is not the norm, what we experience. So check your expectations. You know, you, you, if, if you think that because, because you're a Christian, you should be spared of these things, I, my challenge to you is go talk to a Christian in West Africa or North Korea or Turkey or anywhere else where it's actually hard, hard to live a human life. So check your expectations. Okay, number two, don't trust your eyes. Do not trust your eyes. Remember Star Wars? Remember the, the original Star Wars with Mark Hamill? And he's there with Obi-Wan Kenobi. He's got his lightsaber out. And then Obi-Wan has the little, like, orb thing that goes around and gives him little zaps. And then... Obi-Wan takes the helmet, puts it on Luke's head, and he goes, but with the blast shield down, how am I supposed, you know? Um, and Obi-Wan says, your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. Now, here's one place where we can actually learn from Obi-Wan Kenobi. Your eyes can deceive you. Do not, do not trust them. And I'll just say, in passing, I'm not going to dwell on this, I don't care where you get your news, it is tuning you in to what you can see. The news does not attune your eyes to what is not seen. Paul knew how to tune his eyes to what wasn't seen. He does this, go, go read Philippians 1 today after... He does this in Philippians 1. He essentially says, if he were doing, if he were doing news headlines, he says, here's, here's what the news headline would be. Paul arrested, his ministry is over, acquittal unlikely, death imminent, something like that. That's what the news feed would say for him. He says, I got one though. Paul begins prison ministry and the gospel has reached already the highest levels of the Roman court. That's Jesus' news feed right there. He does it again. The news headline would read something like this. Preacher buys second Learjet and home in Martha's Vineyard profits from the gospel. Paul says there's people out there doing that. And he says, but here's, here's the real headline. The real headline is this. The gospel reaches more and more people in spite of the fallenness of the preachers. See, Paul has his eyes, to, he's not trusting his natural sight. Don't trust, don't trust your eyes. Third point of application, listen to the witnesses. Is that what I put up there? Yeah, listen to the witnesses. Remember, he, Paul quotes Psalm 116 in here, right? Paul has listened to the witness of somebody else who has found God to be faithful. He listens to them. And then Paul, of course, here, is also bearing witness. You guys ever heard of, um, well, we'll get there in a minute. Got to check my notes. Listen to the witnesses. God has been in the business of overcoming evil with good since the beginning, since evil arrived on the scene. That's essentially the overarching narrative of the entire Bible is God overcoming evil with good. This is what he does. He can't not be doing this as long as evil exists. 
This is what God does. And people have seen it, and they've borne witness to it. They've spoken of it. That's what we have in the Bible, is people seeing it and bearing witness to it. And there's people today who have seen God work in their lives, and they are talking about it. So if you've seen God work in your life, tell someone else about it, and listen to the witness of others. Has anybody here heard of mimetic theory? I don't see any. Hmm. You guys must not read French philosophers. Good for you. <laughs> Sorry, that was, a, that was a low blow. There are good French philosophers out there. And René Girard is one of them. And he came up with this, or uh, popularized at least this idea called mimetic theory. And that is that um, our desires and our wants and our intuitions and our feelings don't simply arise from within us as this sort of isolated entity, but we actually develop those desires and needs and emotions by mimicking the world around us. The world around us tells us what we should like, tells us what we should desire, and we believe it. And one of the, one of the reasons why you can tell this is entirely true is because <clears throat> back in, um, you know, shortly after Freud, advertisers started using Freud's theories about the, you know, the hidden superego. And they said, what if instead of selling cigarettes, we sold cool? What if instead of, instead of selling cigarettes, we sold rebellion? And they got people to buy them because they didn't sell the actual products. They put images in front of people's eyes that made them want it. And we do this all the time. You know, we live in Portland, so we deny it. Like there's, like there's no tomorrow, right? We deny it. Like, no, I love what I love because I'm me. This comes from within, right? But we all know, we all know whatever Josh White is wearing, in six months, half the dudes in here are gonna be wearing that too. You know, we know, except for the clogs. Except for the clogs. He's been wearing those for like 12 years, and it has not caught on yet. So I'm holding out. Same with the, well, the gold tooth is not as old, but that one hasn't, hasn't been mimicked yet either. And just so you know, I'm, I'm, not, up, I'm not above the fray in this. Last summer, I was, I, was looking at, I was looking at pictures of Sturgis, and I was looking at jacket. I was looking for jackets. And there was this dude who had this jacket. I was like, that is awesome. I gotta have this jacket. So it took me a long time to like figure out what one it was because I had never seen one like it before. Turns out it was Roland Sands Design Clash Jacket. 650 bucks. And I'm like, oh, I'm a dad. I can't do that. I can't do that to my family. And then I thought, what if I sold something? <laughs> and then my wife talked sense into me. So I didn't get that jacket, obviously. I probably would be wearing it right now because that's how vain I am. But all that to say, I'm not above the fray. I would have never desired that jacket had I not seen it, had it not been in front of me. We make choices to put in front of our eyes and to put into our ears voices and images, and those things affect us. Listen, put in front of you the witnesses of who God is and what he's done. Okay, fourth one, last one. Trust his invisible work. Trust, trust his invisible work. I like this application thing. You know, when I bring them up, I see people like write them down. It makes me feel like people are listening. But who knows, you'll probably forget it anyway. I don't know. We trust the Lord for this, right? So, trust his invisible work. This is not blissful ignorance. I can see how someone would think that. But this is blissful enlightenment, not ignorance. Paul doesn't deny that we're wasting away, not at all. He's saying it's hard, we're crushed, we're perplexed, we're driven almost to despair, but not quite. He doesn't deny what's happening around him, but he says, look, there's more going on than what you see. It isn't blissful ignorance. What is ignorant is to say, what's going on around me the pain, the suffering, that's all there is. God can't be at work because it's this bad. That is actually the ignorant thing to say. The enlightened view is the one that says there's more going on than just this. We may not see it right now. Might have to wait for it. 
might have to wait until you see him face to face, and then it will be explained to you. But just because you can't see it doesn't mean that it isn't going on. You have to trust his invisible work. Uh, you know when, this, this thing keeps on going dunk, dunk. You know when I, I turned down the job here a long time ago, you know what happened after that for Door of Hope? Josh hired Tim Mackey. And he's a better teacher than I'll ever be. Certainly better than I was at that time. <clears throat> and maybe some of you are saying, maybe in 10 years when Josh decides to ask the other Josh to come back, we sh- he should ask Tim instead. I don't know. Maybe some of you are thinking that. I'm not saying that because uh, Door of Hope getting Tim was like a consolation for my pain. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, speak here. I'm not saying, <clears throat> I'm not doing a calculus and saying like, well, is it, is it worth it if enough good comes out of my pain? That's not what I'm doing here. I'm saying God is at work in an invisible way. If I had taken the job, we wouldn't have got Tim Mackey. Here's another way in which God's work is invisible. In 2013, I mentioned that, uh, that I was divorced. 2013 was about a year after. And I was, I was pretty much at the, as low as I got, I think, at that point. And I got to a point where I had actually done the, the youth camp thing where I wrote out, what do I want in life? God, what do I really want? What do I feel like I have to have in life? And I was writing these things out on paper. I had these cards. And I was trying to, trying to, you know, I didn't put them in the fire or whatever like you do in youth camp. But I was seriously struggling with actually letting go of my dreams, with letting go of what was so precious to me. And my, I had paid off my student loans, so I, I finally said, God, I, I'm free to go, and, you know, I'm not married, I don't have any debt, I don't have anything holding me down to anything, so I'll go wherever you want. So I went to a missions conference in, in Vancouver to see, I don't know, maybe God's doing something elsewhere and I could go join God in that. <clears throat> well, there was a guy there. There was a guy there named Ravi Zacharias who gave a talk. And none of us knew that he was a sexual predator, but God did, and God still used him. God still used him to speak to me because when he, when he said, is there, if there's anyone here who wants to give themselves to God with no reserves, no retreats, no regrets, I don't think he did that pointing thing, but, um, but I remember that. I remember that talk. I was one of the first ones down the aisle. I was one of the first ones down the front because I was ready. And one thing I know is that the more I get to know God, the more the more of a uh, the more strange he is to me. The more I love him, the more I want to follow him, the more near and intimate he feels, but also the more I realize he's not like me. He isn't like me. He doesn't respond to the world the way that I do. He doesn't do the things I want. And that gives me encouragement because if God was never like that, I might just be making him up. But God works through horrendous, horrendous evil and through horrible people. And it's a mystery to me, but it's still true. His invisible hand is at work everywhere. Trust, trust his invisible work. When the disciples saw Jesus on the cross, they fled. And sometimes we think that they're wimpy, but you have to realize that what had happened is they went from thinking, we're gonna be in the cabinet of the people who control the world. We're gonna be at the height of anything you could possibly get to. And they went from that down to not only back to the bottom rung of society in the Roman world, but to being personas non grata, to being wanted by the law. Public enemy number one. They're probably going to suffer the same fate as Jesus. So they, of all people, could have said, God, where are you? Where are you? Where was he? He was there on the cross. He was doing the work that they needed to have done, that we have 
need of, to be reconciled to God. God was doing his greatest work at a time of their deepest sorrow and their deepest need. He has to be overcoming evil with good. That's what God does. That's what he does. Trust his invisible work. And if you, if you don't know Jesus, could be that you're sitting here and people can come to church for years and not know Jesus. Or it could be, you know, you're listening online. If you don't know Jesus, you might think this, this other Josh here, <laughs> he's crazy. And all you other Christians are crazy too. You're insane. This is all incredible. I don't believe a word of it. That's fine. I, I understand that. I, I get that. But before you tune out, I will just say this. The fact that you're here or that you're listening through whatever source you are, the fact that you're here and you've listened this far is witness to the fact that God has already been at work on you. So do not resist that work. Lean into it. If that's you, come and talk to me afterwards or come talk to somebody on staff or write me that email. You, you can even write me the angry one. At least I can tell you listen that way. But if you don't know Jesus, you're listening to this because he wants, he wants you to know him. So turn to him. And if you do know Jesus, you've got the same charge. Trust, trust his invisible work.